Welcome, I'm Rogers Anderson, Williams County's Mayor, and as we travel around our county meeting our leaders and different appointment, uh, appointments that are made throughout the county, we have Mac Purdy with us today from the EMA. Thanks for being with us. It's great to be here today. So Mac's in charge of all the emergency management activities that go on, not causing them, but helping to uh, mitigate them and help us out through some of the processes. But Mac, before we actually get into talking about our new public safety building, which we want to spend a great deal of time, it's a, a wonderful new building to uh, talk about and some of the things that are going on in our community. Let's talk a little bit about Mac Purdy, the person. Uh, people like to know a little bit about you and where you came from, where you went to school, and what in the world ever caused you to get in to be uh, the emergency management side of government. Some days I ask myself that question. <laughs> I'm sure that. And I think I grew up here in, in uh, Williamson County. Uh, we moved to uh, the south end of the county when I was uh, before school age, I guess, and, and grew up here and uh, ended up at Vanderbilt. And so I've never been, never been far, far from home, and this is definitely home. I, I think my world of emergency management really started with, with my time in Boy Scouts. And... Uh, being prepared and camping and survival and first aid and those different things and uh, actually there were there was one of the older scouts that came back to one of our scouting events and he had joined the rescue squad in uh, here in Williamson County and I, that had always been something that intrigued me the the firefighting rescue world and that idea of you know not only helping others but but rescue and so I when I turned 18 and went to college, joined, became a volunteer firefighter here in Williamson County and joined the Williamson County Rescue Squad and got interested in that and that turned into an internship my senior year and I think I left my internship saying I'd never worked for, for the government and uh, um, uh, turns out I spent about 13 years at the state and then I've been here almost five I guess uh, doing, doing that work of emergency management and helping make sure that our community is prepared for those different emergencies and disasters we could face. Well, and no plan is good <clears throat> without solid people, and I know you've got lots of folks that mm. you depend on, you rely on, and actually, at the end of the day, you can only be one place. Absolutely, and we, we do a lot of work on, uh, even with the great staff we have, we're a small staff, and so any event that is really gonna tax us uh, can very quickly overwhelm our resources and people and so really we have to work on those partnerships those relationships with different county departments and agencies our cities those departments our nonprofits private sector and then even regionally we do some work with our other counties just to make sure that there's depth there um, should we need it and I think a lot of our viewers might be interested to know that if you live in one of the municipalities particularly in Franklin and Brentwood they have a um, fire and a police division. In some of our other communities, and particularly in Spring Hill, and I should say Spring Hill, throw in there with Franklin too, because they have their own fire and their own police department. But most of our other areas, except for Fairview, as I think about it, Fairview uh, has um, uh, full service too. Mm -hmm. But Thompson Station and Nolansville, they're much smaller in scale. But for the rest of us that live in the unincorporated area of Williamson County, outside those city limits, all of those services are offered by volunteers. Mm -hmm. And even though you don't hire and fire those volunteers, they wouldn't be volunteers if you do that, but somebody has to do all that coordination of training and that falls up under your department. It does, and we work uh, with those volunteer, those volunteer leaders uh, that volunteer their nights and weekends and days, both responding to calls and making sure that those volunteers are trained and uh, the training requirements continue to grow in that fire rescue world. And uh, we have uh, two staff now that, you know, that's their full-time focus is to work, work with those volunteer fire leaders to make sure that we have uh, enough cadre of, of trained volunteers to, to staff those rescues and engines. And, you know, we can always, uh, we're always looking for for new people to add to those groups and those communities, and they really are all across. There are 14 different stations all across the county that that are always looking for people to help them and, and work in that, that capacity. And, and even though the men and women that serve in those volunteer 
capacity, they are not compensated, but they have a great deal of rewards other ways, mm -hmm. such as yourself when you were 18 or 20 years of old work, working in a volunteer role. role. But in, in this county, the way we've chose to provide that protection and help, because it would be totally impossible at this point in our career as a Williamson County government to offer the fire and uh, in all of our unincorporated areas because we're such a vast um, rural area. So we, we have to go the way of the volunteers that gives you those fire protection. But government can subsidize or help the homeowners out there by placing buildings, placing stations, placing those ambulance areas that the ambulances can park in when they're not roaming, which seems like they're always roaming it anymore. Does. But the government can pay for those buildings and help pay for those, those pieces of equipment that are being used. So your tax dollars are actually going towards paying for that. But at the end of the day, a building, a vehicle is absolutely useless without trained volunteers to man and perform the jobs that are required. And just because they're volunteered, they're not let off the hook of anything that Franklin or Brentwood or Spring Hill or Fairview, they still have to have training and they have to have proper equipment. Definitely. And, and they work really hard. Um, nights, weekends is when they typically do most of their training. And in just a few weeks ago, they, they did a, a training burn where they go out and they practice and they, they do those things. And they spent their whole Saturday uh, setting that up and doing that training and running through those drills and just to make sure that they're proficient uh, should they need to, to use those skills. One of the other things we have in Williamson County government that we oftentimes don't touch on, and we want the citizens that are watching this show that if you've got an interest or if, if you're a grandparent, think, well, that'd be good for my grandson, granddaughter to participate and give back in their community because it is service oriented. All of us have to, all of us should be giving something back to our community so that it makes it a better place to live and to and to raise our families. But one of the areas we very seldom ever highlight are our We Care groups. The, you know, the, what I used to call the old ham operator. Mm -hmm. And uh, thankful to you and Bill Jorgensen and others prior to him that a group of men uh, and young people, uh, you talk about Boy Scouts, that's when I was first introduced to a ham operator was a crystal radio set. Mm -hmm. uh, that's way before your time. but. But it got me engaged in thinking about how do we communicate in the event that our electronics go out, our electricity goes out, our computers go out, how do we communicate, Mac? Absolutely. Our, our amateur radio group in Williamson County, I think, is one of the strongest in the state, if not kind of the southeast region or beyond. And everything from voice communications to, uh, I think they've worked on devices smaller than kind of an old film canister um, yeah. with some of our bike races that go on um, in the county to, to actually track uh, where that lead bike or that you know trail vehicle are um, all the way to a, uh, a system where, where they can send emails over those amateur radio, those ham radio frequencies as a backup email. So in our office we have a backup email system should we lose communications that works over that ham radio and it's a system that's used nationally um, in the emergency management of other communities, hospitals, private sector, other partners are getting on board with that to set up that basically radio equipment to send that, that email. And, and so they're, they're a fantastic partner uh, in, in what they do as a hobby. Uh, they also end up uh, you know, using that during our severe weather season for doing storm spotting and um, damage reports and things like that. And then some of those actually volunteer with us in emergency management uh, in, in a greater role, uh, helping us make sure our communications are up and running and working in our emergency operations center. So my point was, and you just highlighted it again, if you've got an interest in that, mm -hmm. if you are getting a little gray-headed like I am and you still want to contribute, it's a wonderful way to contribute. In fact, we'll even help you with the classes, the certification. But I th a couple of years ago, we had a young man in there that was around 12 or 14, so we go the full gamut. Absolutely. And I encourage anyone that's got an interest to that, or if you think you can come on down and sit through it, make a phone call, let's check it out. Let's backpedal a little bit. 2010, May. Hmm. Um, 
this is May. This show's been taped in May of 2016. So six years ago, we had an unbelievable rain that came into the Middle Tennessee area and dropped teens, 12, 14, 15 inches of water over a long, a short period of time over a large, massive area, but mostly in Davidson County around the Tennessee River. Certainly got, uh, got Sumner County, Robertson County, Wilson County, but it got us in Williamson County. We were struggling, literally, to keep our head above water. Here in the administration complex building, where you buy your car tags, was where our emergency management area was located, our 911 center, just about everything that evolved in Williamson County had to come through here because you literally are the one. You have to take over during those emergencies. You have that power enacted to you through the governor and through law uh, to take over and obsess and protect because there's nothing greater than the protection of our citizens in disaster, whether they're man-made or whether they are in this case, from the, from the skies above. Mm -hmm. We're literally bailing water out of the bottom of this building. We have generators going, we have pump machines going, because on the backside of this building, the water was coming in as fast as it could possibly get in. We had sandbags up on the door, the water was rising, and oh, by the way, we got all this electronics trying to keep for police and fire and everybody safe through communications people calling in. Fortunately for us, other than flooding and the trees and some homes being destroyed, we lost no lives. But it was at that point that we decided we have to be better prepared. And luckily, if you call it that, we'd been meeting in a year with the Public Safety Task Force. This task force was made up of nearly 50 people different disciplines, public, private, city, county, TEMA, FEMA, you know, Homeland Security, you name it, in a room, been meeting for well over a year. How can we make it better for Williamson County? Not just facility-wise, but operational-wise. And out of that task force came an idea to at least start with a safe, secure building that would allow us to operate if this ever happened again. But it was also there for the event of tornadoes and many, many other things. We needed a facility that would allow our law enforcement community, both municipal, municipal side as well as the county side, the sheriff's side, to have training, to have our men and women the best prepared that they could possibly be. Over a period of time, a lot of meetings, a lot of trips for you and Mac, I mean you and Bill, many others looking at other facilities across this country that in the month of April, at the, excuse me, at the, at the uh, yeah, in the month of April, we were able to open the doors in 2016 to a new facility that we feel will meet those objectives. We feel that building will certainly be there 50 years. At least. At least. That, now you may have to bring some new technology that's not even <coughs> thought of today. You may have to add a little room on here or there. We've got the ability to do that. But we had to be able to meet the security of our community, both law enforcement, fire, the emergency side, and oh, by the way, we need to have a new 911 center this one was not adequate anymore. We needed to go to a modern, up-to-date, very efficient facility. And oh, by the way, we need to move you out there. And oh, by the way, we need, we called it a public safety building. Now you take and run with it. You know, the, those four to six major needs that, that were identified in that public safety task force back in 2009 and 2010, the the 911 center space for our growing community. And as the population grows, the call volume grows, which means more dispatchers, more telecommunicators are answering those 911 calls. <coughs> and so their space will need to grow and we have to design it for that. Our, 
emergency operations center space, the space where we do that coordination that you were talking about to, to coordinate the community's response to an emergency or disaster, like the May floods or a tornado event or something else should it, should it happen. Uh, the space to put all those key players from our city and county government and our private sector partners and nonprofits. Uh, we, we needed, in, in the world of government and many of the things we do, we need to back up uh, space that was, had backup power and secure for our IT systems for county government and schools and others. And uh, all of these different facility needs, the training facility, um, we were able to layer those and focus on the mission and multi-use space so that that space is getting used as much of the time as possible. Today there's a, a in critical infrastructure class going in from a group from uh, Texas A&M and they're in training a number of people from our community and others on how to protect our critical infrastructure and they're in a three-day class and uh, the sheriff's office is doing a new recruit detention academy class and it, it'll last six or eight weeks and they're there in one of the classrooms today as well and uh, and so that space it's 50 plus thousand square feet hardened to the F5 tornado wind standards which is 250 mile an hour sustained winds. And the, what we, in asking the architects and the people a lot smarter than us are said, it's not just about surviving the event for the people in the facility, it's being able to operate through the event. So when the event passes, uh, we still have to go to work. We still have to be able to support the needs of our citizens in the community and, and coordinate that response. <coughs> and so, so that was the, kind of heart and soul of that project. Just focus on the mission, uh, knowing the hazards and threats that are in our world, and build that, that facility uh, so that we can do this work. When you look at the facility that is currently open, it's off from Beasley Drive. Uh, it's next to the highway department. It's next to the law enforcement community, the sheriff's department, mm -hmm. the firing range. We're beginning to build a campus out there mm -hmm that will sustain just about anything that someone could throw at Williamson County. Now, we're not the federal government. It's not our job. We're not charged with that. But we are charged with the responsible responsibility of safety for our community. <coughs> we're, we're, we're charged with the responsibility, here we are during the tornado season, that somewhere out in Williamson County, hopefully we won't, but there'll be a major windstorm that'll do <coughs> major damage to a home or block a road or take some utility lines out. And it's always amazing to me, within just hours after an event, usually within 24 hours, people still like to eat a hot breakfast. <coughs> and that coordination and getting all that done has got to come from your area. And, you know, that... I think is the <coughs> excuse me probably the biggest takeaway and benefit that we'll see from this facility is because because of the space that's there to do that training to have the meetings and the coordination things that we do day to day uh, that those day to day interactions and relationships and partnerships uh, that's the work we do so that it pays off during that disaster and so uh, that's really our hope and our goal is as we work day to day, each day that we're a little better prepared and more prepared, more ready for that disaster event when it happens. And I was, I was very pleased that I didn't see the competition between the departments, the different layers. Oftentimes that happens in government where one gets jealous over the other one. The sheriff endorsed it from day one, that he wanted to be a part of this. And now, just recently, we've been able to pull together the 911 Center of Franklin along with Williams County. Talk about that a little. Definitely. The, in these <coughs> conversations and partnerships, one of, the, one of the things that was realized is that in our 911, where, where you make that phone call for help, uh, we could be potentially more efficient, that we could save time, uh, we could potentially save resources, but definitely uh, we could provide a better service if we partnered together uh, between the county and the city of Franklin to answer those calls and dispatch those fire, law enforcement, and emergency medical resources. And, and so that project, uh, while a dream for a long time for many people in the community, 
over the last six to nine to 12 months uh, began to be a real conversation and is now uh, taking shape in, in the form of plans and, and the city and the county um, leaders have, uh, you know, are in the process of voting to approve that partnership and uh, the building that we talked about uh, was built with that intent and that vision to should that take place, uh, there's a place for them to go. There's a place for us to consolidate that work so that we can better support not just the emergency responders out there and the work they're doing, but the public as a whole. And when you, when you think about all the things that are occurring in your world under the umbrella of public safety, mm -hmm. We've seen a massive improvement in our volunteer areas from the five points. We've shifted that station to the downs area. Mm -hmm. We've enhanced uh, several of the locations that we've got, particularly at Paytonsville. What a wonderful team of men and women that are going and, and, and giving up and volunteering their time. I look at Nolansville, the efforts that we've made over there. We're concentrating heavily this next year into Arrington and College Grove. We spent a great deal of time and energy out in the Fairview area and we went from having one basic quasi situation over in Fairview to now we've really got two locations. Mm -hmm. But in all of those efforts we're doing, we're not trying to compete with any of our cities. We're trying to work with through interlocal agreements and government, trying to work together. The 911 Center with Franklin that was just recently approved by both the city and the county, county commissioners, will make that a reality over the next few months. I look at so many other things that we can do. We're building a brand new fire station down at the Goose Creek area uh, that will be able to house equipment and an ambulance and service that whole southern part of our county um, when that need arises, including 840. It is almost a baseball throw away from 840. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to position ourselves over the next few years to be able to do that to better serve our citizens and better serve the people that are out there. Of course, none of that can be done without good, capable men and women that we have in our organization. But as I sit back and I make an assessment of what we're doing in public safety, I'm very proud of that. And I think the citizens should be very proud of where we are. I mean, you look at Franklin, I'm very proud that Franklin is one of only just a handful of fire stations in the United States, I think about 130, mm -hmm that have a fire class rating of an ISO rating of one. That's the it's lowest, phenomenal. that's phenomenal. And how does that, what does that relate back to the homeowner? Mm -hmm. Cheaper homeowner premiums for your house. And in those areas where we can work and improve these facilities and get them into our community, then their homeowner rates, which translates over to fewer tax dollars, fewer dollars out of an individual's po pocket to pay for their premiums. Everything we do, we ought to have a reason for doing it other than saying, well, I just want the biggest and best. There's a, there's a madness to all this we're doing. Sure. And we were not prepared in 2010. We made it through it through good men and women in leadership, but we could have been better prepared and now we are. And so my hat goes off to those men and women that are dedicating their life to public safety in all aspects. I think of what our hospital does for our ambulances. I mean, the, the county writes a check, sends it over to the Williamson Medical Center and says, y'all run the hospital. And Alan Lovett does an outstanding job of overseeing the ambulances and the things that occur in our community. But as our community grows, we're gonna need more of whatever that happens to be, ambulances, uh, buildings and locations, and all those cost money. But I think one of the other things I'm very proud of, we're in the second year of funding on this, is this whole communication network we're doing with Brentwood and Franklin and, and connecting up with uh, Davidson County. Kind of touch on that. We've got about three and a half minutes left. Sure. The, the ability to communicate in whatever emergency it is, a medical call, uh, a car accident, a structure fire, or one of these larger events like a flood or a tornado or something that we've talked about, that ability for us to talk to each other is obviously critical. And as we continue having those conversations and partnerships, the re realization is technology changes so fast and uh, radios are 
less like radios now and more like many computers, but the, the reality that uh, all of us came to was we could build three or four systems and then try and tie them together or we could partner together on the front end and build one system that supported all our needs. And that is much more efficient and a much more effective way, both for the communication side, but also from the just the dollars and cents and, and engineering of the system for the people that do that. And then, oh, by the way, hey, we could tie this in with Nashville. So they're our backup and we're their backup. So this idea of partnerships kind of goes to a whole nother level as Nashville and Williamson County partner with each other uh, and Franklin and Brentwood to kind of have a system of systems. And oh, by the way, that'll also tie into the state's new system that they're working with across the state, which facilitates easier communications, uh, the devices and those things. And so again, all that wouldn't happen if we weren't really seeking and looking uh, to serve the citizens the best we can through everything that, that comes across you know, your desk uh, you can't partner. There's some things you just have to do, but where we can find those efficiencies, uh, that's really one of the, the things that all of us, I think, I've seen are striving for. Mac, we've got about two minutes left, and <coughs> um, I'm sure that I have overlooked something, something that's important to you uh, that needs to be said during our show today. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, Bill Jorgensen, who's our public safety director, wasn't been able with it, been able to be with us today, because he's such. The two of you have just done a remarkable job. Um, there are many people. I don't want to start naming names about um, the role that everyone has played, because I'll certainly overlook somebody. But it always takes leadership to knock it off. And so during my process of talking, we're down to about a minute now, and. If I miss something, now's the time to say it. I, I think, I think the, the last thing would be that um, while we work at this every day, um, trying to make our community more ready, that we really look at that preparedness or readiness uh, as all of us having some level of responsibility. And whether that's uh, looking at uh, your smoke detectors or your weather radio or an app on your phone as we're uh, still a few weeks or months left in severe weather season this year, um, that awareness or preparedness at an individual or family level, uh, not worry, uh, not, not spending an extraordinary amount of time, but just being aware as you're out in, in the parks or at the ball fields, uh, whether it's paying attention to the weather sirens or uh, just uh, what's going on around you in your community. I think that preparedness is something that all of us uh, have a part in. Mac Purdy. Charge of our emergency management, uh, time to go. Thank you. Thank you for what you do and to all the men and women that are in this area, this arena, making it a better place for us all to live and, and play here and, and work here. Uh, hats off to all of your men and the women. I'm Rogers Anderson, Williams County Mayor. See you around the county the next time. <laughs>